Welcome, everybody, to another brand new episode of It's My Wrestling Podcast. I'm, of course, as always, your host, Chris Dees. Make sure you hit subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Hit follow if you're listening on whatever audio platforms. Today's guest is a man I've been trying to get on this podcast for ages. We finally managed to sort it out. He's a former two-time WWE Cruiserweight Champion, ECW Original and Tag Team Champion there as well. He's a full-blooded Italian. He's, of course, the one and only Little Guido. Or Nuncio, man. Nuncio, thank you for joining me, man. How's it going? Yeah, thank you for having me. It took a while. It should have been a few weeks ago, but for whatever reason, it wasn't working. I don't think we did anything different this time. I didn't do anything but click it. But when I first did, it did say it's not accepting it on his browser. And then it said, try this instead. And I just clicked something else and it went through. Weird. Technology. It's technology. Yeah. Isn't it? It's just it's just strange. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not great. <laughs> awesome, man. Thank you. Like I said, thank you for joining me. We've been trying to do it for ages. I know you're a busy man, so I'm not going to keep you for too long. So I'm just going to get straight into it. Um, like I said at the start there, ECW original, ECW tag team champion. You're you're one of the names that I associate with ECW. What were what were your first dealings with Paul Heyman like? Like, was he pretty hands on with the little Guido character in ECW or did he give you a lot of freedom? Well, uh, well he's the one that created the little Guido character. <clears throat> Before I went there, um, I wrestled for UWFI in Japan and um, I was wrestling independence before that as Damian Stone. And then I got an opportunity to go work for UWFI in like 1994. And uh, I was going as James Stone instead of Damian Stone because they wanted me to use my real name, but that was more of a shoot style group out in Japan. And, uh, but they couldn't pronounce my real last name, which was Maritato. So it was hard for them <laughs> to say that, you know? So, um, so when UWF closed down, uh, I came back to the States. I worked there for a couple of years and I was living in Nashville, going back and forth from Nashville, going there. And when I came home before I went to Japan, I, I met Tommy Dreamer and Taz and all those guys on the independent circuit. Um, when for, for the Savoldis, I don't know, Matt, IWCCW, I don't know if you remember who they are. Well, you know the Savoldis, but I don't know if you know the group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Ring, rings a bell, rings a bell. Right. So, um, and then before I went to Japan, I was working for Todd Gordon when it was Eastern Championship Wrestling. It was ECW, but it was before it came extreme. So I was working there uh, in, the, in with Tommy Cairo and stuff, even before Taz and Dreamer at the time. So I knew Todd Gordon. So by the time I came back from Japan, ECW changed over and all that stuff to extreme championship wrestling. This is like late 95, early 96. And I was actually wrestling in Puerto Rico. I'm giving you the whole backstory now. I was wrestling in Puerto Rico for Carlos Colon and I met, um, uh, was it Pablo Marquez and he was working for um, ECW and ECW wasn't as big as it ended up getting. It was yeah. a lot smaller at that time. And um, he's like, oh, I'm wrestling for ECW. I'm like, oh, yeah, I heard of that. I said, I used to work there when it was Eastern Championship Wrestling. I'm like, tell Tommy Dreamer and Taz. I said, hello. And that's all I said to him. The next month, I went back to work for Carlos Colon and I saw Pablo. And Pablo was like, oh, I talked to Taz and Dreamer wants you to give him a call. So I gave, uh, I went, when I got back, I gave Dreamer a call. And uh, he told me to come down to the Lost Battalion Hall. He wanted to introduce me to Paul Heyman. That's when we were running Lost Battalion Hall right down from the Elks Club. So I said, OK, so I went down and I remember the first time I met him was that was in Lost Battalion Hall. And uh, I'm like, hey, how you doing? Um, my name is James Maritato. I wrestle as Damian Stone. He's like, I know who you are. That's what he said. I don't know if he knew I was or not, but he, he followed all everything anyway. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and he said, are you interested in working here and stuff? And I said, sure. And he didn't give me the little wheel name right away. So as months went on, I didn't really work TVs that much. I was just doing like house shows. As time went on, he was always like, you know, you remind me of a Joe Pesci type of guy. You know who Joe Pesci is? Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, Joe Pesci. Small guy, but his mouth is the size of a six foot nine guy. Wanted to <laughs> fight everybody. So he's like, you remind me of Joe Pesci. He goes, uh, you know, uh, you know, and every week I would go back. He would always talk about that little character. He's like, I want you to be um, small, but you want to beat up the world and high strung and, and nasty and think you could beat everybody up. There's nobody that can beat you up. You can beat everybody up. And then one day I came into Lost Battalion Hall like two months later and he came up to me, he goes, you're going to be little Guido. He goes, you're going to be J.T. Smith's cousin, which I had on TV. And I came out in Lost Battalion Hall a few months later as uh, and because J.T. Smith started doing the Italian thing. So everybody always really thinks that I was the original FBI member in ECW. I was one of the originals and I lasted there throughout. But J.T. Smith was actually the first full blooded Italian. And then uh, 
he left after a year and then I stayed and I stayed with the gimmick through, you know, Tracy Smothers and Tony Mamaluke and then a bunch of other people too. But the history has it. JT Smith is actually the first full blooded Italian member. And uh, Paulie always had his hands on everything. You know, he, everybody's character. He went from top to bottom, everybody, you know, and uh, he definitely gave you freedom once you got in the ring. He let everybody be themselves. So he gave me, with me, was more a little bit of my character with the Joe Pesci thing. And then it's whatever I did with it. And then he would tweak it here or there, depending on whatever I did. There's a lot of guys that would come in there and he would just let be themselves. And then if he wanted to tweak something, he would, he would tweak it. And that was the whole thing about his TV. You didn't have really times on your matches. We would go out there. Every match could be TV 20 minutes, but it was always tape. So like you could watch, you could do a 20 minute match. And then when you see it on TV, he just shows clips of it or he'll turn a 20 minute match into a six minute match, you know? So but that's the way that was back then. Hmm. All right, cool. So, like, it's, you can't really get better than Paul Heyman, can you, to, like, manage your character? He's one of the greatest minds that there's ever been in the business. Oh, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I knew of him way before then, too. So, you know, yeah. this was the first great opportunity for me. I've never been on – I've been on Japanese TV for a few years, but yeah. nobody knew who I was in America. So then – because then you, you had the dirt sheets or whatever, but you didn't have the internet. You didn't have any of that back then. So whatever you did in Japan on TV stayed there. Unless you had uh, Meltzer's sheet used to, to, to cover us all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. I trust, I trust, uh, I, you know, I trust uh, Paul. He, he did a lot for me. Um, obviously, he, after ECW closed, a couple of years later, he actually got me into WWE too, worked with Vince McMahon. So, yeah. you know, he's helped my career a lot. He's, he's done a lot for me, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you always hear about him. He always, you know, people have said a lot of bad things about him, but he, he puts his life on the line for people, doesn't he? Hey, yeah. always. Hey, listen. You know, and, and I, I've said this before, people that do hate him and talk shit about him, maybe have the right to, you know, maybe they don't like him. Maybe, you know, he didn't do right by them. You, know, you only could judge somebody who, who does right by you. So, yeah, you know, of for me to sit here and, and shit on him for what? If it wasn't for him, I would never had a wrestling career. He put me on TV at ECW, he made me semi-famous there. He brought me to WWE. You know, he, he did the right thing by me. And, you know, people that don't like him, okay, maybe they have a reason not to like him. I, you know, I understand that, but you know, you got to judge people for what they did for you. And I understand I'm with people all the time. They're like, Oh, and I do interviews and people want me to shit on them. I'm like, listen, I don't need anything for Paul Heyman. So I could shit on him now if I wanted to, I don't need anything for him, but it would be wrong for me to do that. You know, I've moved on from wrestling. I'm doing fine and that's it. So there's no reason I'm not afraid to talk bad about him. Yeah. What do I have to talk bad about him about? Nah. He gave me eight years in WWE. He gave me four years in in ECW, and a, and a ton of independence to this day because of those two names I had. Yeah, yeah, man. And you said, like you say, he he helped get you into WWE. And when you went to WWE, you were obviously eventually a part of the the failed ECW reboot, the WWE ECW. Well, right? well yeah, but I went, I went to WWE uh, three years before that. Yeah, I was. I went there at the end of uh, 2002 when ECW did close down. I used to work uh, in the merchandise office with Dreamer and Devon. And when ECW closed out in 2000, you know, Paulie always kept in touch with me, and, and you know, they'd say, "Oh, I'm going to get you a job here one day. I'm going to get you a job." And I was like, "All right, all right." But you know, it was a rough time. WCW closed down, so you had all these top towns there. ECW closed down all within like the same month or whatever. You had all those top towns. And then you had me, which was basically a mid card guy to begin with. Mm-hmm. So it was like I had to kind of wait, like Paulie kept saying, don't worry, I'll get you in, I'll get you in. And there came a point where a couple of years went by. And I, I you know, then I kind of honestly thought it was over, you know, and I started to, to, to not think about wrestling anymore. And I ended up getting a job with Snapple, believe it or not. And I was only working there about a month. And then all of a sudden I got a call from Paul Heyman and I see his number and I haven't spoke to him in a while. And he's like, um, he's like, congratulations. And I'm like, Paul, he's like, congratulations. So I'm like, what, what, what the hell are you talking about? You know, cause I never knew. He goes, I told you I'm going to get you in here one day. I'm like, okay. He goes, John Laranice is going to be calling you and bringing you in. Um, he goes, um, you know, he's and honestly at this time, he's like, don't tell him I called, told you. He goes, he'll be giving you a call in a couple of weeks. Sure enough, two weeks later, Johnny called me, left a message. I was actually in a CVS taking a Snapple order. I come back. Johnny was on my voicemail. He's like, no, he called me Nunzio because I didn't have that name yet. Uh, Guido or James, whatever he said. 
And he's like, this is John Larry Nyers. And Johnny was just getting that spot. He was just taking over for Jim Ross. Yeah. And he's like, uh, give me a call ASAP. I need to talk to her. I called him when I got back to my car. And uh, he asked what I was doing. And I told him what I was doing. He's like, oh, we would like to bring you in for a tryout. He called it a tryout. And I was like, okay. Um, he's like, how's your schedule and everything? And he set something up. And I went into Dallas and um, Amarillo. I did Raw uh, Dark Match versus uh, Funaki. And then I did another dark match the next night at SmackDown or vice versa versus Stan Bowley, believe it or not, who ended up being my partner years later. And then at the end of that, um, they uh, Jim Ross came over to me and said, Johnny wants to talk to you in his office. And they offered me a job. So I don't think that was actually a tryout. I think I actually had the job. But, um, you know, they, they Johnny made it sound like a tryout. And the reason I think I had the job is because Paulie called me a couple weeks before that and gave me a heads up that he was calling me. You know, so. And so I was in WWE in 2000, end of 2000. So I was there uh, before the uh, the ECW. I was there before the remake. That was in 2006. So I was there doing the Cruiserweight thing versus Tajiri and all that. I, mean, I was Jamie Nunnable's cousin. Um, and then I was with um, me, Chuck, and Johnny. You know, we were working with The Undertaker, Brock Lesnar, as the, as the full-blooded Italians at the time. And then Chuck went to do the biker gimmick. I think Johnny got released. But then they brought back the old ECW, now 2006. So I was part of that failed ECW uh, for whatever, as long as it ran. I think I was there to the end. And then I went back to SmackDown, I think, for a couple. And then I uh, I think that was it. Because I was released in August 2008. Yeah. So so that was it. So, um, so yeah, I was there before. And it was actually cool when they did the remake of ECW in the beginning because everybody thought it was cool. Because then they brought all the old guys back, the guys that didn't work there. Danny Doring, Balls Mahoney, Axel Rotten. You know, guys that didn't have a job there or never got there after ECW. And it gave them an opportunity for whatever it was, a year, year and a half, two years, whatever it did. Um, so, you know, it, it actually helped and you did it work. I don't think so. You know, there's a lot behind why it didn't work. I don't really know all the logistics, but, you know, obviously it didn't according to everybody. So, yeah. And yeah, obviously it closed down. I've heard a lot of people say a lot of different things. I've heard Paul Heyman himself say some things. I think Vince just didn't like it, did he? He always felt like Vince just wanted it to do badly. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, I, he would know that better than me, of course. Yeah. And I've heard him say that too, because he was, I think, I think, and it's my own, you know, my own opinion is, you know, I think when they're supposed to get it, uh, it's supposed to be Tommy Dreamer and Paulie running it like it was back in the day. And it never was like that. Vince had his hands in it, and Vince was behind. It. He was there at all. Well, he was at all the TVs because we were basically taping at the SmackDown and Raw tape things anyway. So we were taping after that show went off the air, <clears throat> you know. And I was there the night Paulie quit. It was a uh, December to de- December to dismember. It was a pay per view I did. It was me and Mama Luke versus um, Burke and uh, what's his name? The big guy. If I'm forgetting his name, um, whatever it was, and uh, yeah. Paulie quit that night. I remember I was, uh, he called me on the phone. I forget exactly where we were. And we were already, we were at SmackDown. He says, come to a big show's a truck, whatever. Yeah, the bus. And he was in there and he's like, just let you know, I quit. I'm like, really? He said, yep, I'll be, I'm gone after today. I, I said, I said, okay. I said, I'm sorry to hear that and everything. And But him and, I know for a fact, him and and, uh, and um, Vince McMahon were button heads way before that. You know, they were, Paulie wanted this, Vince wanted this. Paulie wanted this, Vince wanted this. Paulie wanted to do this, Vince wanted to do this. You know, but you never know the way things work out because you see what happened there. And then years and years later, Paulie came back as the head writer, you know, a few years ago. And Paulie still works there. You know, yeah. Paul's still there, you know. I mean, things don't work out, but, you know, you, you, you know, he's very talented and he's definitely, you know, definitely helps the company. Yeah, I don't think he's the writer anymore, but he did it for a couple of years. It just seems like, any writer who's there, no matter how great you are or not, I think after a couple of years, you know, nobody's ever there. I mean, Gerwitz was there for a long time. And actually, uh, Ed's still there, I believe. I always got along good with him, um, Koski. Um, but, you know, what? for guys like, you know, guys that were famous that became writers there seem to come and go. They come back sometimes, but they come and go. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely got a lifespan, haven't you? Like a, a certain shelf life. As a writer in yeah. WWE, definitely. Um, right, let's move away from WWE for a minute because I want to ask. I want to ask about TNA because I was really surprised to see you pop up in TNA. I think it was Hardcore Justice. You were only there for about three weeks, just under three weeks. 
Why? Why did well, that... they? Are, they are, they didn't. They didn't. They didn't want us there. That was Tommy Dreamer oh, did yeah. that. Uh, you know, at the time it was. Uh, and and I I've spoke to you know and I, I do Eric Bischoff often. I didn't know Eric Bischoff at that time that well, but I, I ended up getting to know him when we were in W in WWE. Yeah. Um, but at that time, that's when uh, Vince Russo was running it and um, Eric Bischoff and Hogan and them. And I don't think there was really a place for us. I was Dreamer, did that one big pay-per-view and everything and, and was trying to get all the guys in. And then they offered us the contracts on TV. And then I do remember when, um, you know, Dreamer saying they're going to offer us all contracts. And then me, Mama Luke and a bunch of other guys were left off of that going to the ring to receive the contract. So I went to Tom and said, Tom, you're telling me we're getting contracts. These, it doesn't look that way. I'm hearing that we're not even part of the angle anymore. So basically they brought us in just to get over the Bobby Roode and them and James Storm, which was fine. We agreed to do it. They were honest with us in the end, the last day, they told me the truth. Um, so it, it didn't last, I think, because they, I wasn't figured in there. Yes, I came in for the big pay-per-view that Dreamers set up, uh, which was a uh, hardcore justice. And then uh, they, they used a bunch of us guys uh, for a couple of tapings after that. But um, me, myself, and Mama Luke, and a couple of guys, I don't think uh, was was on the list. Not for any reason. Not that Vince Russo hated me or that Bishop hated me. I don't think for any of that reason. I just think their creative minds didn't have anything for me. And Dreamy was a part of it, and he had something for me, thought I could help out. But at the end of the day, you know, that's that's what I believe, you know, that that – those guys didn't have anything for me and nothing personal. It just, that's just the way it goes. So yeah. my run there was uh, more of a walk. I wouldn't call it a run <laughs> and end up, you know, it lasted a month and a half on TV, but it actually only lasted about three weeks because you taped, we taped, you know, it was taped. So we did a couple of things in, in one. And then I'll be honest, the last night, and I appreciate it. Terry Taylor came up to me because he was the, the head of talent relations there. And um, he's like, guys, listen, this is one of the last TV tapers I did. They wanted us to go with against Bobby Roode and um, James Storm. And they were getting a nice push at the time. And Terry's like, listen, guys, we're not bringing you back after this. Uh, we'd like you to go out there and have a match with them. Honestly, the match is going to be about 80-20. Now, if you go back and watch it, you can watch it on YouTube. It was on TV. Um, they, they even asked if we can get color for them, but they understand if we didn't want to do it. Um, you know, we could, we can go home. They would pay us, but we're not going to be brought back. But we're basically what they were asking me and Tony's, we're going to squash you out. If you don't mind, we're going to get color. But I gave him a lot of respect for that because the, the, the way it could have went was, Oh yeah, you guys are coming back. You guys are coming back, but don't worry. You know, just do this match 80, 20, get some color. Blah, blah, blah. Then I go home and I never get a phone call back. Yeah. And that wasn't the case. Terry Taylor was 100% honest with me. And then I said, I, I said, let, let me talk to Tony. I talked to Tony only for a few minutes. And I said, said, Tony, fuck it. And I said, what, what's the difference? You know, let's just do what they ask us to do. And uh, and we're not going to be back. You know, and, and I was it. And, and I even said to Tony, I said, I gave him credit for telling us. You told us that you're going to basically squash this out. You're going to get color. And we're not bringing it back. I was like, I mean, how much honest can you get? How could you just say no? Yeah. You know, yeah. how could yeah. I say no? You know, he was very professional and and I really did appreciate that. And then that was it. That was it. We did that match and uh, it was over. Yeah, you don't hear about honesty in, in the wrestling business very often, do you? It's all or no. the opposite, or the backstabbing, yeah. or the, or the bad Terry sort of Taylor, things. Terry Taylor was 100% honest with me and I, I appreciate that. And uh, we went and did professional and, 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 uh, and that was it. Then we went home and didn't hear from him since. Although I oh. did hear from him afterwards when, when Scott DeMore took over, I did stuff when they were doing uh, the House of Hardcore stuff. Yeah. How about um, how about Ring uh, Rinka King? Rinka King, when you were you were there as Tony Broadway, that only lasted for one yeah, season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and Joey Ryan. Yeah, that yeah. came about. Um, that was, uh, okay, that was TNA afterwards, too. Uh, uh, that was after TNA. Yeah. I did the TNA thing, and I got a call because at that time, um, uh, Join a black guy's name, and he helped Dave Agana. Dave Agana, who's a uh, who always treated me very well in ECW and WWE, he was one of the big writers there. Um, he took a liking to me too. He wrote some real good stuff for me. But I guess that time he was with TNA, and then uh, him and Jared, who I knew Jared, you know, not know him, but back and forth because he knew of me, I knew of him. We were well, obviously I know who he is, um, and he watches the show. And I think I was in WWE for a couple of years while he was there. 
or he came and visited or something, whatever it was. But uh, they got involved with uh, with Rocky King. And then I got a call from um, Lagana and he's like, hey, we're doing this thing with Rocky King. We want you involved. We're going to have you. And um, and actually me and Joey Ryan did that Hollywood and Broadway. We did that in um, in California for Marquez when when um, when Lagana was running helping him book. So we actually did it there after, you know, before we went to Rocket King. So anyway, it was Lagana that basically got me in there and he was the writer and they wanted to bring us in and make us use us as uh, Hollywood and Broadway. And uh, unfortunately that only lasted like two seasons. You know, those, uh, those people weren't fans. You, you had to hand feed them. I mean, it was the easiest job in the world because they were told when to cheer, when not to cheer. They just wanted to look good for TV. Yeah. You know, it even got to a point where I'm, I'm not so sure this is true or not. But supposedly they were getting paid as like extras, like the, oh, you know, just to try to get this off the ground. I don't know how true that was, but I do know that we, before the cameras went on, that we were warming them up and, you know, booing and hiring the right people because they didn't really know who who anybody was. Yeah. You know, you, but it was the easiest crowd to work in front of because they were, they, you know, I don't think they were fair. Now, I know um, WWE goes out there all the time now. You know, so obviously they own the WWE, but they didn't really know. And that was an in, India-based company, Rocket King. We worked. It wasn't like a company from the United States, like the WWE went over there. You know, these people, except, I mean, we had some big names over there. We had Steiner and all of them, but, you know, we don't, we don't know how much these people knew some of the, the bigger names because they were, you know, depending. But supposedly they weren't really smart fans, you know, yeah. and you know what I mean by smart. They weren't smart to wrestling. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, yeah. They were it was like more of a it was more of like making Rocky and just filling the arena with, with extras, paying them money if they paid them money, and then telling them when when to cheer, when not to cheer. But it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, and it's an experience as well, isn't it? I guess. Like it was Yeah, yeah. It was it was a great time. We 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 you know, I mean, that was my first time going to India. It was it was two we went for two weeks did a bunch of tapings like one season then we went home for like two weeks then went back and we taped this i think we taped the same season so i don't think it made two seasons right it only made one season you could watch that on either yeah. yeah so we but we taped it in two different sections we were there for two weeks went home for two weeks went back for two weeks right and then um and then you know i, I watched i was just watching that not too long ago on, on the internet so that's the good thing about the internet anything you do on tv you always can go back and watch so but yeah, that was a short uh, stint. But I think we didn't go back there. I mean, I think we all would have went back if it would have caught on. I don't exactly know what happened there. I'm not sure what didn't catch on. You know, maybe the TV ratings I'm going to go with. Um, only because, you know, the, the arenas were packed. Was, uh, the, the, however, they got them in there, you know. Mm. But I don't know what happened. I guess ratings might have not have done well. And yeah. that was it, I guess. I, th- that part I really don't know. <laughs> I don't think wrestling was a, was a really big deal in India at that point, really, was it? That's nearly, what, like 15, 20 years ago, or roughly, I think. So it wasn't, I don't think it was a really, well, really big deal then. When when I did the Rocky Ring King King, let's see, it had to be out yeah, of WWE in 2008. I did TNA 2010. I would say about nine, 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. More recent. Oh, so maybe, yeah, maybe it was just in 2021. It couldn't be 15 years ago because 15 years yeah. ago. You know, I was still in, I left WB in 2008 and it was, and I did the TNA thing. I did the TNA thing for a little while. I did a lot of independence. So I think I went over there in 2010, 2011. So I would say nine, 10 years, you know, but I don't know. I don't know. Was w, when I, I don't, I don't remember ever going to Italy, Italy, I've been Italy a million times. I don't remember going to India um, in, in W when I was in WWE. I don't remember anybody right. going to India. And when I, I don't remember, I don't know. I know I never was there. So I don't know if um if anybody else was. And they go there quite often now, don't they? I think they I think they've been yeah, now training they, camps there now as well. Yeah, now they seem like they're there all the time. All the time. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. So I mean it definitely became popular recently. It was just it wasn't, you know, the company that we went for was I think India was trying to build their own brand, mm. Rocket King, their own India instead of, you know, the WWE. But, yeah. No, hey, it was a good try. They tried. Yeah, yeah. Can't blame them for trying. Um, one one thing that I really want to ask about. Um, in storyline, your character obviously didn't agree with Vito being a crossdresser. But how did you feel about it? Because I know 
I know Vito enjoyed playing that role. I know he, you know, he's been asked, people have assumed that he hated it, but I know that he really enjoyed it. How did you guys in the locker room feel? Because it was at that sort of time where I imagine some of the more, you know, I don't know, some of the more old school wrestlers might not have liked something like that. Oh, well, nobody said anything. I'll tell you what, I give Vito a lot of credit for, for doing that. And I was there when we came back. They were using me and Vito for, uh, um, you know, as a tag team for about a year or so. And then I remember one time we came back and Stephanie, uh, somebody said, Stephanie McMahon wants to talk to you guys in her office. So we go in there and um, I believe Vince, Vince McMahon was in there too. And that's when they put, now I'm standing there. Now that's when they presented this gimmick and, and they were telling Vito that you're, t- they don't, they didn't want it like a, a, a gay gimmick or anything like that. You're not going to, you don't have that. You're a tough guy, but you like to wear a dress. And, and they said, but you, we don't want you, you go out there like a machine, you know, like an animal, like Vito, you are, but you like to wear a dress. And the gimmick is going to be, I never knew this all this time. So then built it into a little storyline. But in the very beginning, I'm like, oh my God, they're going to ask me to do this too. I don't, I don't really want to do this. Um, but he embraced it. I give him a ton of credit. He made it work. Yeah. Um, and then, and then they asked him, you know, to wear the dress everywhere he went. He was wearing it in airports. He was wearing it on the airplane. He was wearing it when he was going to stores, you know. And then, but he got pretty popular. So a lot of people that would see him knew who he was. Yeah. But I mean, that that's a lot to ask for someone to dress as a, in a dress to go to stores. Well, nowadays not not as much maybe it was ten years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but that was, uh, but that, that, that was a gimmick. I, I remembered, um, but that was what they had for him. I mean, he could have said no. So I don't think nobody, nobody, um, you know, a lot of people said, oh, it was a rib towards him. I don't, I'm, I'm not so sure it was a rib. I don't know, you know, but, um, you know, it didn't affect the boys. Nobody made fun of him or did anything to him. Vito is actually a pretty tough guy, you know, he, he, no, he's not, he's no pushover. He ain't going to let you sit there and let you make fun of him. You know, he's not going to sit there and take any shit from anybody. Vito's not, no. He's a tough guy. And that's where they came up with that gimmick. You, you, you're not a flamboyant guy. You're a tough guy. You just like to wear a dress. <laughs> that, that was that was the gimmick. So, no, I don't remember anybody. Um, you know, unless there, there might have been people that told stories that they, you know, sometimes you hear the story. I don't know how true it is, but I, don't know, I didn't hear anybody. I mean, it was rough one time because I used to, sometimes I would, uh, you know, we, well, we really wouldn't travel because we don't supposed to, you know, when Vito draws attention when he's walking through the airport with a dress on big bald muscle guy wearing a, a dress so it's like we couldn't travel together because we were doing the whole cross he was doing the cross dressing and i didn't know about it but there yeah. were times i was in the airport and you walk you walk by with Vito, people look at him like you're looking at andre the giant that was double taken because it's like that guy wearing a dress you know if he wasn't with me sometimes i look ordinary if i'm resting my regular clothes i gotta add on i could just walk right through when you're walking with a guy wearing a dress big bald guy built it draws a little bit of attention to you. Yeah. So actually, uh, yeah, going to stores with him sometimes, and then and, and in the airport at times I was with him. You know, he, he drew he drew some attention, but again, he embraced the character and he made it work. You know, kind of like I heard that story about Dusty Rhodes when they put him in a poke docs. People said that was a rib. I don't know how true yeah. it was, but Dusty took that gimmick and made it work. But Sapphire, he was over like crazy, and people said it was a rib. Whether it was or not, I don't know. You know, but Dusty took that gimmick and made it work. They put him in pick and dodge. He's a guy from the NWA, you know, wrestling with Harley Race and Ric Flair. And he's in WWE. And then all of a sudden he's wearing polka dots. You know, so, uh, you know, he made that work. And that should be an inspiration for people. No matter what they give you as a gimmick, if you can make it work, make it work. Yeah. Man, at the end of the day, like. All of a sudden it's not a rib anymore. No, no. If that's if that's a rib, like, fine. I'm on national TV and I'm being paid a lot of money to do it. Rib me. That's fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'll do it. You know. Yeah. I don't no. think it was. You know. No, I don't think it was. I don't think it was either. Would you? You said that you were worried they were going to ask you to wear a dress. Would you have wear, worn a dress if they'd have asked you to do it? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I, you know. I don't really know. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not saying anything no, wrong with it. No. It's up to you if you want to do it. You know. It's just. It's. Some people would, some people would. I don't know. It, it may, I, I think that's a decision that they had to come down to. Okay, do I want a job or do I not want a job? Yeah. You know, of course, yeah. Uh, right now, it's easy for me to sit there and go, I could tell you right now, no way I would never wear it. No way. I, no, that's not the case because now I could say that knowing that it's over and 
doesn't matter anymore. But that's not what I was thinking then. Then I'm like, oh, man, don't ask me. I was undecided because I didn't know where they were going with it. You know, so, you know, I don't know. I don't want to sit here and act tough like right now, 12 years later when it's all over and don't have to worry about it, (laughs) that uh, I would, you know, stay stern and be like, nope, I would have never done that. You know, who knows? Who knows what it would have been like? You know, who knows? You know, but again, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just it's up to you. On where you're gonna cross dress, you cross dress. Who right. cares? <laughs> Hindsight's twenty twenty, isn't it? Who knows? Could have been great. Could have yeah. been terrible. Who knows? Could have been terrible. Could have been great. I mean, I think he did it better. He had a better, different type of look. You know? Yeah, he did a great you job. May, yeah, yeah. He he made it work. He made it work. I believe he made it work. No, a hundred percent. No man, I do. Anyone I've spoken to in the past does as well. Um, James, look, man, I, I'm. Really happy that you joined me. I'm really happy we finally managed to do this. I know you're a bit pressed for time, so I'm, I'm not going to keep you too much longer. Um, but I know that you're you're still doing shows. You're still taking bookings. So before I let you go, what shows have you got coming up soon? Any events, signings, conventions, anything like that where people can find you at? Yeah, well, um, Guido under slash Nunzio is my Instagram. They might want to follow me or Nunzio under slash Guido. You'll find it. It's one of the two. Nunzio under slash Guido. Guido under slash Nunzio. I'm actually doing a, a show um, this Saturday for Tracy Smothers. We're doing a memorial show out in Nashville, Tennessee. So um, but by the time this airs, that show is going to be over. Um, and then I got a few things coming up. But, they're, they're, you know, I know I got I actually got to look at my book. But I, I'm, I'm keeping busy. I wrestle three, four times a month. Um you know, I'm having some fun. You know, I've got a regular gig going on. I run a security company now during the week. And um, that's it. Pretty much retired from wrestling and uh, just having some fun, making some extra money. Yeah, man. Why not? Why not? Absolutely. Awesome. So my Twitter, my Twitter is the same thing. Guido under slash Nunzio. Anybody wants to follow? Yeah, man. I'll put all of that in the, in the description. Well, you know what it is. You are. I know that. Yeah, yeah, I've got it. (laughs) I'll put it all down there in the description so people can just click away and find you. I'll put some links in there for any shows that you've got coming up as well. James, man, thank you. Like I said, thank you. I've been been really looking forward to this. I'm glad we finally did it. We had some issues getting it done, but I'm really happy we did. Thank you for giving me your time. Guys, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. As usual, you know where to find me. It'll all be in the uh, About section, all the different audio platforms, all the different social medias. It's my wrestling podcast, and I hope to catch you next time on It's My Wrestling Podcast. Thank you.